Okay, just a few uh, housekeeping things to uh, take care of at this time. Want to remind everybody that uh, you have an opportunity to send us your questions, your thoughts, your opinions on this year's conference. Uh, we hope all of you are able to get your questions answered. And if we're not able to answer them during the conference, by all means, we'll be taking a look at all of them and we'll get back to you uh, after the conference concludes this weekend. So uh, we also hope that you were able to take a swing by and take a look at our exhibit hall. We hope you'll be able to take care of, take advantage of all of our network op opportunities that we have for you. We have some great games. I think uh, people have already been playing, be it whack-a-mole and some trivia questions and some blackjack. So we hope you're having a good time uh, connecting with new people. And by all means, uh, some of you will be uh, kind of reconnecting with others that you've met at previous conferences. So we, uh, we hope you're having a great time with us and we hope you're uh, gaining some of the knowledge that you've all been looking for. So um, also a reminder, last year, uh, yesterday, uh, we introduced the Hope Tie that we are auctioning off. Um, this gold tie is, uh, is being auctioned through uh, my website, or I should say my email address. So if you want to put a bid in on our Hope Tie, uh, just send it to me at joel at ataxia.org, and uh, we will be uh, providing some updates on where the bidding stands uh, throughout the conference. All right, um, here's our first session for the day. And uh, with a topic like ataxia drug treatment targets and pipeline, uh, it's bound to gain a lot of interest. And we have a tremendous presenter for you today, uh, Dr. Susan Perlman. And Dr. Perlman is a clinical professor of neurology and the director of the ataxia center at UCLA Medical Center in Los Angeles. Um, Dr. Perlman has been seeing ataxia patients for more than 30 years. She's seen a lot of change, and you're really going to enjoy what she, hearing what she has to say. Dr. Perlman, it's all yours. Thank you, Joel, and thank you, National Ataxia Foundation, for putting together this wonderful virtual meeting for the 2021 annual Ataxia Conference and for inviting me to give the keynote talk today. This is going to be a lot like people sitting with me in my office. Um, many of my patients will let you know that we often have long discussions about drug treatments, targets for various medications that are in clinical trials, and the development of the pipeline for new drugs for ataxia. So let's move to the next slide and give the warnings that we always have to about not plunging into any new drug trial on your own without discussing it with your physician. And also recognize that I always take the opportunity to talk with any drug company that has something in the pipeline that could be important for ataxia patients. Um, and here are the groups that I have spoken with in the past year. With the birth of modern computing in the 1970s, we developed an armamentarium of techniques and strategies to really push medical progress ahead and push drug development ahead, steps that were never possible prior to then. I've profiled a number of disorders that have leaped forward in the last 30 years, infectious diseases, genetic diseases, and the non-genetic ataxias. I think the disorders that have been most eye-catching and potentially most important for larger numbers of people have been the progress in infectious diseases, HIV AIDS, was first described in 1981, had its first approved drug six years later, and has developed preventative therapies in 2014. There's still no cure, there's no vaccine, but viral levels can be reduced to undetectable for people who have been infected with the HIV virus. And we were able to do this because of improved understanding and how retroviruses hijack the cell. Hepatitis C was first described as the third type of infectious hepatitis 
1989. First approved drug, 1991. There is now a curative drug regimen that became available in 2014, but there's no vaccine because of the characteristics of the infection and how our immune system responds to it. We were able to make this progress because we developed understanding of how the virus replicates itself. However, public health crisis remains that there are still ways to be exposed to this um, in the homeless community and in other parts of our population. So the disease is still with us. Another infectious disease, which is a little closer to the ataxia is prion disease. Um, there's genetic prion disease, gerstmann straussler syndrome, and there's non-genetic prion disease, Jakob Kreutzfeldt disease, mad cow disease. Prions, infectious proteins, they aren't really viruses, but they behave like viruses, were first described in 1983, and we were able to understand how they replicate, how they spread through the nervous system. But you'll notice there are no approved drugs and there's certainly no cure yet, despite our improved understanding of how these infectious proteins behave. Genetic diseases, Duchenne dystrophy. The gene was described, discovered in 1986. The first approved treatment was recognition that steroids could help modify disease progression only just in 2017. And a genetic treatment, which is almost a cure, not a perfect cure, came out around the same time in 2016 with knowledge of how to manipulate the DNA to create a functional gene that could make functional protein by a technology called exon skipping. Spinal muscular atrophy, a death sentence for children before the age of two. Gene was discovered in 1995. First approved drug was in 2016. Again, it's not a cure, but it can modify the disease. And the technology, the knowledge that helped us develop this treatment related to how to splice and repair an alternative gene that could then take over the work that the mutant gene was not doing. Friedreich's ataxia gene was discovered in 1996. New knowledge that has grown over this period of time, understanding the mitochondria that produce energy, understanding gene regulation that should be producing the frataxin protein. But again, you'll notice no approved drugs, and no cure. Spinal cerebellar ataxia. The SCA1 gene was first described in 1993, led to our understanding of toxic proteins produced by the mutant gene, causing what's called a gain of function problem, where the protein produced by that gene may do its normal job, but has additional functions that are destructive of the nerve cell. And again, no approved drug, no cure. And finally, the non-genetic ataxia is the one we're most familiar with multiple system atrophy, was first described as a discrete condition in 1996. We have certainly had new knowledge, better understanding of the synuclein protein, which forms the protein aggregates in cells in the nervous system, but again, no approved drug and no cure. We can see from some of the diseases that have reached the point of having approved drugs or even potentially curative treatments that it could take 25 to 30 years from knowledge of the disease, knowledge of what the disease moiety is doing until ultimately drug development can be successful. 25 to 30 years, that's over a generation. Next slide. 
resources that we currently have for progress in developing disease modifying treatments for the ataxias are a public private patient partnership. We know that public moieties, the National Institutes of Health, the FDA provide funding, they support research, they support drug development. We know private foundations, the National Ataxia Foundation, the Friedrichs Ataxia Research Alliance, a little further down, the MSA Coalition provides support, key funding for initial steps in drug development, and organizational framework for collaborative efforts with industry, with drug companies, with researchers, with clinical researchers, and with the patient community. And the National Ataxia Foundation Drug Development Collaborative has been launched and is effectively bringing us closer to the goals and missions of our pharma partners. The Ataxia Global Initiative is a worthy effort from our European collaborators to bring all the ataxia components worldwide together with common goals. And patients and families like you who are willing to step up are the key factor in leading to these successes. Next slide. These are two slides that Dr. Klockgether, Sinovsik, and Graysner gave me permission to use from the Ataxia Global Initiative to show how we will be pulling together all of our resources. On the left, they have designated the road towards molecular therapies for the ataxias, treatments that could be disease modifying for the ataxias. The goal is to make ourselves currently ready for clinical trials of these agents. They have pointed out that we have already laid the groundwork in identifying genetic factors and the mechanisms that they cause disease with, developing rating scales, ways to measure ataxia, and also gathering patients um, who can be representative of the diseases that we are targeting so that in order to ready ourselves for clinical trials, we have our patients registered, we have biomarkers that will help us track the disease, ideally disease improvement with various treatments that are in development, and also working with regulatory agencies on accepting our strategies to measure ataxia and to measure ataxia improvement key of which is patient reported outcome measures, where you as the patient participating in a clinical trial or other treatment regimen can actually say, I feel better, I feel worse, I feel the same. And the regulatory agencies, the FDA will listen to that. Preclinical drug development is going on in the drug companies and other research and development groups, including universities and private labs. And ultimately, these will lead to clinical trials. On the right-hand side of the slide, the Ataxia Global Initiative has shown how they have brought together um, organizations, um, joint projects that can be shared across national and international boundaries um, there are multiple study networks that are supporting patient registries and natural history studies, and there are single sites um, that are also leading the way in gathering patients and collecting data. This data can then be anonymized so that people contributing data about their own health status won't be able to be recognized that data can then be shared with the Critical Path Institute, which will work at making sure the measures and biomarkers are adequate 
to support a clinical trial and that data analysis will also be adequate with the design of the trial in process. So that we're hoping that our ataxia global initiative, which was begun a couple of years ago at our last face-to-face -face meeting, will help bring together all the minds, all the research, all the patients and their families to really speed up the development of the drugs that will modify ataxia. Next slide. This is from an article um, by three of the giants in our clinical research field, Dr. Ashizawa, Dr. Oz, and Dr. Paulson. I think many of you know these individuals. They have spearheaded research and have put together a wonderful review article that I think will be readable by anybody, not just a, a physician or a researcher. They focused on the spinocerebellar ataxias, looking at the knowledge that we have developed and how that can be translated into drug development. Similar outlines could be done for Friedreich's ataxia, could be done for the non-genetic ataxias. But here, um, they have shown on the left-hand part of the slide, the disease genes, and for spinocerebellar ataxia, it's approaching close to 50 individual disease genes that have been identified. The disease transcript, where the gene transcribes a messenger RNA, and then the disease protein, which is produced from the messenger RNA. You can see in red, they have highlighted the mutation in the disease gene, which in the case of the common spinocerebellar ataxias is a triplet repeat expansion. There's a segment of the gene that has normal coding, you know, normal typing as it were. The mutation in the common spinocerebellar ataxias causes a stutter as it were in this area so that that segment of the gene is enlarged or expanded it can still be transcribed into messenger RNA. And the messenger RNA produces a protein that has a segment of the protein that is enlarged, folded in an abnormal way, may or may not interfere with the normal functioning of that protein, but that expanded segment of the protein leads to protein clumping, altered function of other proteins may go back and alter the DNA itself, upsets the normal nerve functioning, and upsets energy production. So on the right-hand side, we can see targets to interrupt this cascade of dominoes at every step. And some of you, I think, are familiar with this terminology. Um, is there some way that we could snip out that gene mutation? CRISPR technology and similar technologies are being looked at in test tubes, in cellular models, to be able to snip out the mutated part of the gene and join up the normal gene so that it can then go ahead and make its normal messenger RNA and normal protein. If there is no obvious way to safely snip out the gene, can we block the gene from making the abnormal messenger RNA? And there are technologies that have been developed that can do that. We can also target the messenger RNA to prevent it from making protein or to force it to make a protein that is more normal by altering the way the messenger RNA is behaving. If the protein ends up being produced, um, do we have ways to reduce the level of abnormal protein or prevent it from becoming toxic 
Can we make it easier for the cell to get rid of the abnormal protein? Can we make it unfold itself and fold itself into a more normal structure that won't be toxic? And then downstream, can we find ways to break up protein aggregates or clumps? Can we protect other parts of the nerve cell activity? Can we improve energy production despite the gene stress that's going on? And there are drugs in development at every level of this ataxia treatment protocol, um, including repurposing existing drugs to help us fight back against this gene stress. Next slide. I have profiled three pipelines. The ataxia pipeline for spinocerebellar ataxia uh, was last updated about six months ago. It is derived from the structure of pro pipelines that we've seen for Friedreich's ataxia, Huntington's disease. Um, and I think the categories of drugs in the pipelines for all of these disorders um, are shared so that progress, let's say with Huntington's disease, with um, an anti-inflammatory drug might also be applicable to spinocerebellar ataxia or Friedreich's ataxia or multiple system atrophy. So even though we have separate pipelines and drug companies may choose to be involved with one pipeline, one component of a pipeline, as opposed to another disease pipeline, there is going to be cross application that will speed up drug development across the board for all of these disorders. You can see on the left-hand margin of the pipeline for spinocerebellar ataxia in different colors, the different approaches that we have just discussed. The red part of the pipeline at the top looks at stabilizing the nerve cells that have been targeted by the defective gene. The purple one includes drugs in development to improve energy production and reduce free radical damage. The dark blue pipeline tries to reduce toxicity from certain neurotransmitters, in this case, glutamate. The yellow one works on getting rid of the protein aggregates. The green one an anti-inflammatory approach, since whenever nerve cells are damaged, there's inflammation that increases the damage. Can we block the inflammation and slow up damage? The pink one, you know, can we stimulate nerve cells to regrow? Can we use stem cell therapy to help repopulate damaged nerve pathways? And at the very bottom, and probably still in the earliest stages of development, ways to silence the mutant gene, to block the mutant gene from starting that cascade of bad events. You can see in the center part of the pipeline, the drugs that are in development and the level of development that they have from the very earliest stages, preclinical testing in the laboratory, through interactions with the FDA, through human testing in the phase one, phase two, and phase three levels. The only drug that has currently been approved for treatment of ataxia was not approved by the FDA. It was approved in Japan, um, Taltirolin, and may actually be coming to the United States as an FDA-sponsored trial as well. But many of the other agents at various levels of development, you can see are in phase three or phase two or approaching the point where the FDA will allow them to move ahead into human trials. You can look up the studies that have already moved forward into human trials on the clinicaltrials.gov website by plugging in the type of ataxia, 
and looking for treatment trials that are in process or will be beginning soon. Then you can get information about where the trials are going on and what some of the basic requirements might be for you to participate. Next slide. Here is the Friedrichs ataxia pipeline that we're all familiar with from the FARA website. Again, showing the different ways that drugs and development can intervene and the level of development. Here we can see that there are more drugs that are approaching the phase two, three level of testing, but none have yet crossed the finish line to drug approval. Next slide. Similarly for multiple system atrophy, this is the pipeline from the MSA Coalition website where they have divided the drugs in development into those that are focusing on the orthostatic hypotension, the low blood pressure at the top on the left, drugs just below that that can modify the disease process and slow progression and slow nerve cell damage. And on the right side, drugs that are still in very early development, but being supported by the MSA coalition. Next slide. So what we are relying on you to do, network with your support organizations here and abroad, join registries, participate in clinical trials, biomarker studies, natural history studies, Every individual that steps up to participate strengthens those efforts to bring us to approved treatments for ataxia. Ask questions of your peers, your doctors, your researchers. Many of the emails that I receive every day are from patients who have seen an article or heard about something on the news. They wonder if it's something that could apply to them. They want more information about how it might help you know, the work that we're all doing to reach cures for ataxia. So don't be shy. Get those questions out there and question the answers. If you are frustrated or angry, use that energy to help shorten the historical timeline of 15 years to bring a good idea to an approved drug. I think we've already cut that timeline in half, but we still need to speed up this process and your energy will help that. Speak up to the FDA and to the drug companies about your goals. The National Ataxia Foundation, the Friedreich's Ataxia Research Alliance have set up ways to communicate as a group or individually so that the FDA and the pharmaceutical companies know what we want. And let's make this the last generation of ataxia.